Kingdom Focused. So glad to welcome you into another experience of worship and we're grateful to God to be able to connect one with another electronically. As we've been saying, my prayer is that you will take this time while you are in the house to seek the face of God. And one of the ways that we're trying to empower you to do that is by making available to you the resource of our 21 day reset devotional. All you have to do is go to our website, kingdom.global, download it, follow it every day. I know you'll be blessed. Uh, since you're here, I don't want you to leave out the same way you came in. Listen, each week we've been talking about staying connected. I hope that you're not just allowing these words to come through the screen, but I hope you're taking advantage of the opportunity, the means of grace that God is giving us to stay connected one through another. Even if you don't feel the need to connect, you don't know how your presence will be a blessing to others. And so uh, we're asking that you would check in with us. All you have to do is uh, text the word Zoom to 31. 3131 and you'll get a link where you can then be uh, put into one of our uh, Zoom groups and you'll be able to see the smiling faces of your brothers and sisters. Even if you're not a member, we'd love to meet you and get to know you. We just want to make sure that no one feels isolated and alone during this season. We want to check up on one another as a faith family together. Living through a global pandemic can be frustrating, confusing, and even frightening. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Every generation in human history has had to deal with pandemics. Therefore, we should not simply make pandemics plagues. God is using this season to do something supernatural. If you let him on the other side of this, God's got better. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm just saying it's going to be worth it. I don't know who I'm talking to, but this is what God told me to tell you. Whatever you've suffered over these last few weeks, whatever you've lost, whatever you've had to experience, I come to declare that I serve a God that recycles. I serve a God that causes all things to work together for the good of them, that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And I wonder if there's anybody that's watching me that's a witness to the fact that if you give God a little little becomes much when you put it in the hands of God Woo, come on praise the Lord kingdom fellowship we came to bless him and to give him glory hallelujah bless the whole my soul all oh, that's with him we're gonna bless his name oh hallelujah Jesus we love you we thank you for this opportunity to praise you we give it all to you. We trust you. Hallelujah. Have your way in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together, everybody. Right there where you are. Let's love on him together and say, oh. Bless his holy name, oh, holy, bless his holy name. Come on, you sing it from the seat. I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This holy name. Let's touch this fire on this. He has done great things for me. Come on. He has done great things. He has done great things for me. Yes, he has. His holy name. Oh, bless His holy name. Come on, let's sing it one more time from the top. Say, I. Yeah. 
has done great things for me. everybody under the sound of my voice we lift it God is the joy strength of my life come on God is the joy and the strength of my life he moves on he moves on promise to keep me promise to keep never to leave me never to leave never ever never I'm short of short of this Cause I want to go I with want him. to go when he, he comes back he comes back come too far come too far and I'll and never I'll turn never back.
and we honor you. We thank you, Lord, for being Lord of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are Lord over our situation. God, we put all of our trust in you. Kingdom focused. Praise the Lord. This is Pastor Watley, and I'm excited about sharing this time of Bible study with you. I pray uh, that all is going well with you and your family, that you all are keeping safe and that the Lord uh, is sheltering you and strengthening you even now. And uh, we're just uh, continuing to be uh, just amazed at how God continues to provide and protect uh, throughout this season. We continue to pray for those uh, who have experienced loss and we uh, glorify God for uh, providing strength for those uh, who are grieving. We also thank God for those who have recovered and for those who have been healed and delivered. I just got a testimony this week uh, of a good friend of mine who was awakened at one o'clock in the morning um, with the doctor in the ER saying, uh, we need to know in terms of uh, the, the responsibility uh, to resuscitate. And he, he had already been in conversation with his father. His father told him he didn't want to be resuscitated. And so uh, he said he, he got off the phone and, and went back to sleep. He said he was at peace. And uh, we just got word that he's now being dismissed from the hospital and uh, is continuing to recover. So we just give God glory even in the midst uh, of trial and trouble. We know that God continues to be faithful. Just want to continue to encourage you to stay connected with us. You already know uh, it's very easy. All you have to do is text the word Zoom to 313131 and uh, we'll be able to stay in touch with you. We just want to see your smiling face. Even if you're not a member, just come on and uh, be a part of the fellowship. We also want to encourage you uh, that if you are in need of support during this time, uh, we'll, we continue to feed persons uh, every week. And so all you have to do is text, text the words Kingdom Care to 313131, and uh, we'd be uh, honored to serve you. And uh, we're just uh, believing God for great things on the other side of this. And I'm going to get right into the word of God, because as usual, I have a long way to go, short amount of time to get there. Come on, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and praise for the signal honor that is ours to stand before your mercy seat, to come before your throne of grace, uh, to find ourselves uh, the privilege of being able to reach you through the power of prayer. I pray now, God, for my brother, my sister that tunes in even at this moment. I pray that you might quiet the confusion of the culture, that you might allow them to hear your still small voice. God, grant them faith sufficient to walk forward in whatever direction that you are leading them, knowing, God, that you will not leave them, but you will always be their God, their guard, and their guide. I pray now, God, that you might make these moments sacred by your presence. Come by here, Lord. Somebody needs you. We come to receive a word from you. And so speak right now, not just to our situation, but speak to our souls so that we can handle our situation and have you choose to move. In these next few minutes, we give you glory and praise in advance. It's in Jesus name. We want to say thank you. And all God's children said, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we continue today in the series of uh, sermons and lessons we have been sharing for the last week or so under the general heading, Now What? And uh, I just want to add another component to it. Again, uh, this is the first time I've done an extended series of sermons and lessons based on current events, but I think these are no ordinary times as I tried to share on last week. And so I want to go a little bit further on that tonight. Let me start off our conversation by picking up right where we left off on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, we talked about on the other side of this. And of course, uh, you can check out the full message if you hadn't had an opportunity to do that yet on YouTube. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're constantly uploading things things and that will allow you to stay connected with us and uh, that will allow you to uh, have something that will feed your soul spiritually uh, as we make it through these days. But on Sunday, talked about on the other side of this, and of course it was based on uh, Noah and the ark, this little passage of scripture found in Genesis, the seventh chapter, and the first verse it says, the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, a male and its fe and male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did, verse five, all that the Lord commanded him. 
So this is one of the most simple uh, messages I think I've ever preached. Uh, I just talked about three phases, uh, life before the ark, life in the ark, and life after the ark. And what we know about life before the ark from, for Noah was this, that God chose Noah, Noah not just because he was righteous, because he was faithful, a man of faith, but also because he was a contrarian thinker. His faith caused him to go outside of the norm, to step back from how the rest of society was, was flowing. Remember, God tells Noah to build a huge boat in the middle of a desert. Now, that sounds kind of crazy. And then God says, because I'm going to flood the earth with rain. And again, according to some scholars, rain had yet to be seen on the earth. The earth had been watered from that point from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And so he tells him to build something crazy because something he's never seen before is about to come. But yet, despite how uh, non-conventional uh, this command is, the Bible says Noah did all that God commanded him. And I just want to say again, I honestly believe that the way that we're going to make this through, make it through this season, is that we're going to be able to trust God hear the voice of God and follow along in faith rather than being so easily influenced by all of the other sources of this world. In order for you to survive, in order for your family to prosper during this season and come out better on the other side, I believe you have to disconnect and you have to divest from just listening to everybody and everything and attune your ear to the voice of God. And when you do, God is going to call you to do some things that are, that are nonsensical, that are non-traditional, that are non-conventional, that are contrarian. God tells us all the time stuff that doesn't make sense, like forgive. Forgive God? You, do you really know what they did to me? Yeah, forgive because even though it goes against every instinct and everything you've been taught, the truth of the matter is forgiveness is your first and best step towards healing. God continues to give us kingdom principles and kingdom principles are always going to be contrary to that which the world says. And so you have to decide whether you're going to repeat, believe the report of the Lord or believe the report of man. I don't know about you, but I choose to believe the report of the Lord. And so uh, the, 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 the pre-ark uh, the pre -arc life before they got into the ark and, and the flood was coming was all about Noah trusting the voice of God and heeding his voice in strategic ways. I'm not saying you should listen to the news or good counsel, and certainly we continue to shelter in place because that's the best advice that's been given. But there are gonna be some times uh, as we continue to move forward, there have already been times when we've as a family and, and as have had to say, listen, this is our priority. Our priority is redeeming this time. So we're going to be intentional. We're going to be intentional about how we spend our time, that we're not just going to be together in the house. We're going to be together as a family unit. And so we've started uh, some new practices that encourage that rather than just simply allowing ourselves to be together, but still be a part. And so I want to encourage you to really seek the face of God as to what he's calling you to do uniquely uh, that may not be consistent with the culture. The second thing we see is, of course, life in the ark. And uh, as they're in the ark, we recognize that it's a cramped situation. You have the full family in there. You have all these animals uh, in there. The ark is being pitched to and fro on the water. This is an uncomfortable situation. They're in quarantine and life uh, cannot be naturally easy. And I just want to ask, as you're in quarantine right now, whether as a single uh, person in a, in a multi-bedroom house or apartment or condo or efficiency, or whether uh, you have a big family or a small family in a house, it doesn't really matter. If you have a mega mansion, the truth is you don't have enough space right now. You don't have the freedom of movement, and so you feel cramped and confined. The truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, the question is not where you are. The question is, what will you do with where you are? Are you going to redeem this time and allow this to simply uh, serve as an impetus to move forward in that which God has purpose for your life? Or are you simply going to try to wait out your time and go right back to the life you were living before you had to be in the ark or in uh, your home? What's your po my point? My point is this that there's a difference between simply being incarcerated and being uh, in a correctional facility. Incarceration means I'm on lockdown, but to be in a correctional facility means I hopefully am receiving new skill sets and things that change my values and characters so that when I come out, I'm a better person than when I went in. My prayer is that you will use this as an opportunity to allow God to correct some things in your life, uh, your eating habits, the way that you uh, navigate relationships. By now, you should pick up the pattern 
it can't be everybody else is crazy. It can't be everybody else is trying to get you, that everybody else is conspiring and plotting or hating on you. At some point, you got to recognize that you're the common denominator and allow God to deal with you, allow you to see yourself, get some counseling. You can do it uh, via Zoom. And, and, and so there are resources available so that you don't mirror the same person that you were when you came into the situation. Finally, uh, we look at Noah after the ark. And what's interesting, I didn't share this on Sunday, but there's really no negative connotations given to Noah's character before he goes into the ark. But afterwards, the Bible says he comes out, he plants vines, he makes wine, and then he gets drunk and falls asleep naked. And of course, this becomes a spiral for uh, his family. What's interesting is that his time outside of the ark, uh, where he engages in drunkenness is symbolic of the fact, of course, that humanity is still fallen. Humanity is still corrupt, that uh, the rebellion that existed in Genesis three and Adam and Eve, even though the entire species has, has been wiped out of Noah's family, those, those, those that DNA continues to uh, fight forward in the flesh. And now, uh, even though it's a new generation, uh, they continue to engaged in the same habits. My prayer is that we don't simply survive this, but we go into good success, that we allow God to bring us to a new level of living and new level of living means I don't simply I have life and I eat and I drink and I have a sufficient income. It means I'm living in my kingdom purpose. I'm operating godly authority. I'm aligning myself with the will, the word, the way of God. I'm allowing God to stir up the gifts uh, of the spirit on the inside of me. I'm allowing God to use me in ministry. I'm allowing God to use my resources to support the church in the kingdom. I'm allowing God uh, to speak life to others who are connected to me. I'm allowing God to allow me to be a witness to his kingdom and to his church. And so I just want to encourage you, don't settle for uh, simply survival when God has purpose for your life, good success. I want to go further because I have a, a, a lot I want to share. Uh, I want to start talking tonight uh, about uh, the, the title for tonight is Canoeing the Mountains, Canoeing the Mountains. And uh, this, this title really is taken uh, from uh, a, a wonderful book by a man by the name of Todd Bolsinger. He actually is my professor at Fuller uh, in my Doctor of Ministry program. And uh, he, he talks about in this book, and I think I've made reference to it before, how the old story of Lewis and Clark exploring uh, the west of the United States. Uh, at that time, the, the, the thinking was that there was a water route that would lead them from where they were all the way uh, to the Pacific Ocean on the west coast. Uh, they thought that once they got to the other side of the, uh, the mountains, that they would find a great waterway that would allow them to go. And so as a consequence, they were carrying with them canoes. They, they were carrying with them uh, canoes that would allow them to sail rather than having to walk or ride horses or, or wagons. They were prepared for what they thought was going to be on the other side of the mountains. And of course, even if you don't know the history, you can already anticipate the story. They climb up these mountains, they get to the other side, no water. And so what do you do when what your plan had been to move forward fails? What happens when those things that you had acquired to aid and assist you turn out to be irrelevant to what you have to face right now? What's interesting about the story is that as they face this new challenge, there are some people like, you know what, this is not what I signed up for. They started making their way back. There were others who decided to settle where they were, where they were, and then there were others that were willing to go forward recognizing that even though we did not anticipate what was in our way or what we we're going to confront, that still doesn't stop our ultimate goal and destination and plan. And, and interestingly, as they went along the way, they actually picked up other persons that were interested in going with them. The, the point of this simply is that none of us, none of us, none of us, none of us saw ourselves being uh, in quarantine. None of us saw uh, the tragedy of tens of thousands of deaths in our country. Uh, and of course, even more around the world, none of us saw the economy uh, being torn asunder. But here we are. And the question is, now that we're on, on the other side of this mountain with these canoes that are proving themselves irrelevant, what will we do? How will we navigate? How do we lead when it's time to live off the map? How do we uh, deal with life uh, when we did not anticipate what life was going to throw at us? This is the now what question. How will we respond? How will we react? How will we choose to move forward or will we choose to stay where we are? He, here's a couple of leadership lessons that I think are important, not simply for the kingdom of God, but simply for navigating life in general. Here's one quote from uh, Dr. Bolsinger. From Lewis and Clark, we learned that if we can adapt and adventure, we can thrive. That while leadership is uncharted, ter 
while that while leadership in uncharted territory requires both learning and loss, once we realize that the losses won't kill us, then they can teach us. And mostly, we will learn that to thrive off the map and ex in an exciting and rapidly changing world means learning to let go, learn as we go, and keep going no matter what. This, this is a power, I, I hope you can appreciate the significance of this concept because I just, let me take 20 seconds to say, life is not about what happens to you, life is about how you interpret and then respond to what happens to you. And the only way you can have a different interpretation is if you have a new lens and new thoughts through which to see the circumstances. And so what he's saying here is very clear, listen, don't simply look at what's happened to you as a negative even though it certainly is, has negative impacts in so many different areas, adopt the I concept that this is an adventure. And of course, there's no adventure without a sense of danger. But that sense of danger also uh, can be reinterpreted as providing a sense of intrigue, a sense of wonder as to what's going to happen. What's interesting is that you've engaged this sense of adventure before in your life usually not in the spirit of faith. Normally, it's when you're doing something wrong, when you're going someplace you're not supposed to go and doing something you're not supposed to do and hanging out with people you're not supposed to hang out with. There's something in you that gives you a sense of adventure. It, it gets your blood racing. It gets uh, your pulse going. You're excited because all of a sudden you feel animated that life is a little risky. Well, guess what? That same sense of wonder, that same sense of adventure is available to you right now. Even though these may not be circumstances that you chose for yourself, you can still choose to accept them, accept them as adventure. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Lance Watson often points out that there's a reason uh, that the disciples were drawn to Jesus. It wasn't just that he bid them come follow me, but it was also because he was giving them a blank ticket. He didn't tell them where they were going, what they were going to do, what they were going to confront. There was a sense of adventure that, that motivated these men to follow Jesus. And I want to suggest to us that when we start embracing kingdom living as adventure, when we start embracing life as adventure, then it gives us a different framework than just fear and worry and anxiety and what's going to happen. It starts to make us feel like, hey, there's some possibilities here. There's some opportunities here. There's some options here. And hasn't that been your experience in life and with God that whenever you allow God to bring you to a new place, it's a little scary, it's a little dicey, it's a little sketchy, but guess what? He always proves himself to be faithful and provides you more than what you were even anticipating. And so uh, he talks about how we have to uh, embrace the sense of adventure. He also talks about how leading uh, an uncharted territory requires both learning and loss. What that really means is first, uh, if I was planning to canoe and canoeing is no longer gonna work, that means first, I've got to learn some new modes of moving forward. I've got to adapt to some new ways of transporting myself. But I've also got to accept the fact that what I was planning didn't work and that I can grieve my loss, but my grief cannot be my final state. And so what I'm suggesting is, even though you may find yourself in a different season and now you're having to rechart your career and rechart your financial plan or rechart how your family is functioning, all I wanna suggest is loss is a natural part of life. You cannot live without losing loved ones, without losing opportunities, without losing um, uh, really expectation even for yourself. Uh, being disabused, that you are not a superman or superwoman, you're human just like everybody else. The, the issue is not loss. The issue is, again, will loss be your final chapter? And I want to encourage and challenge you to recognize uh, that as you grieve loss, because that's how we handle it, we go through those various stages of grief, God allows us then to marshal ourselves forward if we will simply put our trust in him. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out that he talks about is not, again, not simply surviving, but thriving off of the map uh, in a rapidly changing world. And I've talked to you before about how I believe whenever there are seismic shifts in society and culture, uh, that those provide new opportunities for those who are agile and willing to recognize those opportunities. Here's one more quote, and we'll get into uh, the word of God. Leadership is energizing a community of people toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a changing world. That's not a lot, but it really is a lot. Let me do it one more time. Leadership 
is energizing a community of people toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a changing world. What he's really saying is, first of all, if you're going to do anything of significance, it requires leadership. Why? Because if you can do it by yourself, your vision is too small, which means if you're going to lead, if you're going to do something great, it's going to require you to do something else in order for you to, uh, to, to engage other people. In order to engage in people, you need to be able to motivate them, to encourage them, to hold them accountable, to do all the things necessary in leadership to accomplish the common mission. And I want to suggest that no matter who you are, where you are, God has called you to lead. He says you're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. What that means is even if you don't have the title of president or CEO or even parent, that still doesn't mean you can't lead. Some of us have to learn to lead from behind. But leadership, listen, is all about influence. It's about using that which God has given you to encourage somebody else, to motivate somebody else to accomplish a mission, a goal, or a great purpose. I want to encourage you that no matter where you are in life, God has strategically positioned you to be an influencer for the kingdom, to help others, to, to give them, get them closer to God, get them closer to the kingdom, aligning themselves with God's word, God's will, and God's way. And so I just want to encourage you that through this season, when there's so much doubt, there's so much confusion and chaos, that your voice will have greater weight, greater authority than in any other season in your life if you allow God to show you how to use it. And so allow God to begin to well up in you the gifts of leadership that have been laying dormant for so long. I wanna move forward because again, this whole concept of canoeing the mountains is always about, is really about being able to pivot from where you were, what you expected, to where God wants you to be. Let's get into the word, 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, beginning reading the ninth verse. There it says, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha said, a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far part of the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became, became clean like that of a young boy. Brothers and sisters, this, this is a powerful passage because uh, it shows us what it looks like to have to deal with a uh, changing situation where what you expected is not what you found. And now the question is, now what? Now, what are you going to do about it? So here's what happens with Naaman. The Bible says Naaman goes to Elisha's house. Naaman, of course, you remember, is a leper. He doesn't have the kind of leprosy that allows, that forces him to restrict himself from society, uh, but he still suffers from the ailment. And so he ends up uh, finding out that there's a prophet in Israel named Elisha. He goes and he's asking uh, for him to come and heal him. When he gets to the house, he comes to his house ready. He comes prepared. He's got his whole uh, um, he's got his whole entourage with him. He's waiting uh, for Elisha to come out and to say some magic words. He's brought with him gifts of gold and new clothing. He, he, in his mind, he's got this thing all figured out. I'm a man of standing. I'm a man of society. I'm a man of wealth and means and power, influence. And, and as a consequence, in fact, I already went to see the king because I want them to understand who I am. He's going through official channels. In his mind, He's got this whole thing worked out. So he's come prepared for what he thinks is going to be the way to get the blessing. And the Bible says that the man of God, Elisha, does not even come out of the house. Instead, he sends a servant with a message. Hey, listen, uh, the man of God says, go down to the Jordan River, wash there seven times and you'll be cleansed. Notice the conflict between uh, Naaman's preparation uh, and his expectation. And now actually what happens? He had in his mind what was going to happen, how his life was going to turn out. He had gone to watch night service and had all these great plans for 2020. Uh, he had uh, written them down and, and what was going to happen. And all of a sudden, all his plans were thrown out the window with something called COVID-19. Naaman's in trouble because his situation is not lining up with his preparation and his expectation. And so he ends up in frustration. He gets upset. He gets an attitude. He's offended. He says, listen, 
He, I'd expect him to come out and say some magic words and wave his hand over my spot. And he wants me to go down and wash and the Jordan River are not the abandoned, the far part rivers from back home. Aren't they more clean than that old dirty Jordan River? I mean, who does he think I am? He gets frustrated because life is not turning out the way he expected. And I just want to speak a word to somebody who right now feels like your name is naming because life ain't turning out like you expected. Uh, you had the vision for your life that you're going to grow up, go to school, get married, uh, find you a wonderful spouse and live in a beautiful home with a white picket fence and a dog named Spot and two children that would 2.3 children that would obey every command and just do wonderfully in your life. And life has not turned out like that. I want to encourage you to know that just because life has not turned out the way you expected does not mean that God is not yet superintending the affairs of your life. What you do have to do is have faith sufficient to trust God beyond your expectation. I'm not saying you shouldn't be frustrated. I'm just saying, again, frustration, just like fear, should not be final. So the Bible says a lot. A name is about to pack up and go back home when his servants grab a hold of him. Hey, master, don't mean the metal. Not trying to get in your business, but can we just ask you one question? If the man of God asked you to do something difficult, something spooky, something you see on TBN, if he wanted you to do something crazy, you'd probably engage that. You'd probably do that, wouldn't you? Well, if he asked you to do something great and difficult and you're willing to do that, why don't you just do, crazy thought, what the man of God said? Brothers and sisters, so many times I believe that we try to substitute superstition for spirituality. That we want God to do something amazing. Flick the lights, do something magical. I want to see a great miracle. When the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, God often speaks in a still small voice. That God doesn't necessarily have to move through the fire and through the earthquake and through the wind. But in a still small voice, he will grant you direction and don't allow your expectation of the, the, the supernatural and the big show to rob you of the still small voice that is God leading you to the place, place of your uh, transformation. So the Bible says that they, that they talk to him and after they talk to him, here's what I like, he modifies his plan. He's, he's willing to receive wise and godly counsel. He receives the word of God through them because he did not receive it through the man of God. Did you see what just happened right there? It's one thing for me, Pastor Wadley, to speak a word. But it's another thing when colleagues and cousins and co-workers begin to speak that same word. It comes from a different direction and oftentimes it has more impact and meaning. That's why you've got to get in the word. That's why you've got to be prayed up. That's why you've got to start seeing yourself as a kingdom leader and a kingdom influencer. Because it's one thing for, for me to say it, but God oftentimes will use your voice and magnify your voice to bring somebody else in to the kingdom and to move them forward towards faith in a manner that I can. And so I want to encourage you to know that God will again strategically position you to be a blessing in somebody else's life. Here it is. He pivots. He thought that it was going to go one way. It doesn't go his way. He gets frustrated, but then they speak to a word. And here's the part I like. He pivots. He says, okay, I'm going to do what, what the man of God said since y'all told me. He goes down to the Jordan River. He washes seven times. You don't know what happened. The manifestation of the promise of the man of God comes to pass in his life. Uh, his his uh, spot is cleansed and his skin is restored, the Bible says, like a little boy. Let, let me give you just two more passages. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this pivot situation. In John, the sixth chapter, beginning reading from the 66th through the 68th verse, it says of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The context for that passage, and I commend it to your reading uh, later on, is that Jesus has just made one of his crazy statements. You know, when you look at the life and ministry of Jesus, you often wonder, were you really trying to get people to follow you? Like some of the stuff you're saying, bruh, I mean, you know, whoever doesn't hate mother, father, sister, brother is not uh, worthy to be my disciple. You know, I mean, here Jesus says, listen, if you're not willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. Like, are you telling us we should be cannibals? Clearly not. Jesus is actually making allusion to uh, the Lord's Supper, but it doesn't sound like that at the time. They don't have the ability uh, to know retrospectively what we know right now. The point is that after Jesus made this statement, many people started walking away. So Jesus turns and asks the disciples, y'all going to? Y'all going to leave me as well? Peter steps up. 
Peter says, where else can we go when you have the words of eternal life? Peter's statement is, listen, this is not what we signed up for. This is not what we expected, but we at least have sense enough to know to recognize that you are the Holy One of God. And therefore we're sticking with you even sometimes when you're telling us to do stuff that we don't understand. I want to say to you one more time that through this season, God may challenge you to do some things that are not conventional, but you've got to, to trust God's voice rather than the muscle memory of your mind, rather than simply going with what you've been told and seen and the patterns that are dysfunctional or non-productive that have brought you to where you are right now. Now is the time to break the cycle. Now is the time to trust that God really does have the words of eternal life. And whatever God tells you to do, just like uh, Mary, Jesus's mother, told the servants uh, at his first miracle, she told them, listen, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so whatever God is saying to you right now in this season, and he'll confirm it through others, is you got to trust God and move forward in that. Let me give you one more passage. And this is going to be a little difficult one. Uh, it's found in 2 Samuel, the 21st chapter. Uh, there uh, in the 10th verse, these words are recorded. Rispa, daughter of uh, Ai, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock from the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies. She did not let the birds of the air touch them by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Ai's daughter Rispa, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. They had taken them secretly from the public square at Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them after they struck Saul down on Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. The Bible tells us that how Rizpah lost her seven sons. Uh, these uh, were sons of uh, Saul, and after Saul had lost the kingdom, uh, everything was going in the wrong direction. Uh, and this woman finds herself uh, uh, orf, uh, being the, the mother of seven sons who were killed and their bones are left exposed. And now the, the carrion, the, the, the vultures are feeding on them. Bible says she begins to every day fight off the animals, fight off the birds to keep and preserve their bones. Now, here is the point for this, for this passage in my life. Whenever I read this passage, I'm struck with how it's one thing to have faith for what you're believing God for, for promotion and for blessing and for healing and for deliverance. It's one thing. It, listen, it's hard enough to have faith for what you want, but it's another thing to have faith for what you don't want. She never had to. She never, I'm sure, thought that she'd be in a position of having to guard the bones of her children from animals. But this is what life has brought her. But she pivots. And she's willing to accept the challenge. She, she has no uh, no promise that if she does this, that God is going to move on the heart of King David and give her son's proper burial. But she's made up in her mind that what her circumstances are right now are not going to define her or end her. She's going to make the best of a bad situation and she's going to have faith for what she never desired. I want to say to us, we never desired this. Nobody asked for this. Nobody prayed for this. Nobody anticipated this. But even though we're here in a circumstance we did not want, we need to have faith in God for what we did not desire, what we did not pray for, what we did not request and trust that God will show up that God will hear our prayer and hear our cry, that God will honor our effort, that he will reward our sacrifice, even in this season where it feels like all we're doing is fighting for bone to, to keep things away from, from taking all uh, of the light out of our lives. That when we do that, God has a way of working on our behalf in places we don't see. While she's fighting, she doesn't know that the word has gotten back to David. She doesn't know that David has made the decision to come down and see about this situation, that, she, that David has made the choice that he's going to properly bury her sons. While she's doing this, she doesn't know that it's working. I want to say to you that even though you don't see any signs right now, you got to trust by faith that it's working. That while you are preparing yourself, getting new certifications, getting new uh, degrees, while you're uh, looking for new employment opportunities, while you're trying to re reshape your life and reshape your family and reshape your marriage and reshape your single life and reshape your priorities, while you're going through this season and you don't see any results right now, you've got to trust that it really is working. That's my testimony, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That at the end of the day, we did not know what Jesus did before he did it. 
but he did it anyway. And that now once we come in a saving relationship with him, we receive all of the benefits of his great sacrifice on the cross. I, I'm concluding with this question. Do you know him for yourself? Are you saved? Have you accepted Jesus in your personal life as your personal Lord and Savior? If you're listening to me right now and you're unsaved or unsure, you've lived like this long enough. It's time to pivot. It's time to turn to God. And here is the blessing of God. God declares that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's not going to hide from you. He sent his son to suffer and die for you. So he offers you right now salvation. All you need to do to receive salvation is to understand that salvation is not something you can earn. It's something that God paid for. But you do have to accept it. It's like signing a check uh, and, and cashing it at the bank. You don't get the money till you endorse it. So right now, your way of endorsing is to connect with us. The Bible says, if you confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart, he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved, which means that salvation is not simply a personal, private thing. It's also a public thing. Now, don't get nervous. I'm not asking you to go on Facebook and uh, tell everybody that you're accepting Jesus. What I do need you to do, though, is click the little tab on your screen right now. One of our prayer counselors is waiting for your name and your number. They want to call you. They want to show you in the word of God what salvation is all about. They want to pray with you the prayer of salvation. And you'll go to bed knowing tonight that if you don't wake on this side of eternity tomorrow, you'll wake up with God in glory because now you'll be saved. So if you're unsaved or unsure, this is God's opportunity and invitation to you. If you're already saved, if you're a Christian, but you don't have a church home when you're growing in God, I don't believe that right now you should be disconnected, dismembered from the body of Christ. And so if you're not a member, a part of the body of Christ that's called the church, then I want to invite you to join Kingdom Fellowship AME Church wherever you are. Don't worry, don't worry about if you're not an AME, they ain't worried about that. We're a Bible-believing, spirit-led church. We're, we're committed to serving God and serving God's people. We're kingdom focused. And so I want to encourage you to use your gifts as a part of building up the body of Christ. If you right now cannot honestly say that you have a church home where you're going, that on this Tuesday night, I invite you to join this church. I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your church. You go ahead, click on that tab as well. And one of our prayer counselors will be in touch with you and welcome you to our, the church. Finally, if you need to rededicate your life, if you've fallen off, but through this season, you're hearing God saying, it's time to pivot, it's time to come back to me. The joy of the Lord is he's married to the backslider. You can't go far enough. You can't mess up enough where the love of God can't reach you and can't bring you back and restore you. So I want to encourage you to click that tab as well. One of our prayer counselors will reach out to you, pray with you and offer you the opportunity to be restored fully in the faith. Listen, I'm so blessed and privileged that you chose to spend this time with me. And I want to encourage you to share this message with others. I've been under a special burden to speak specifically about the times in which we're living. I want to encourage you because I believe others that you know will be blessed. You can serve just like when a name and servants to share this word with others. So go ahead and use your platform and social media email it out. Let somebody know the word of God is available to them as well. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you and we glorify you for you are a great God. You continue to do great things even in uncharted territory. We thank you, God, that when we go off the map, you still are the God of the whole world. And so now, God, I pray for my brother, for my sister, that you might give them pivoting power to turn to you and to follow you in faith. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. All God's children said amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Kingdom focused. God is using this season to do something supernatural. If you let him on the other side of this, God's got better. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm just saying it's going to be worth it. I don't know who I'm talking to, but this is what God told me to tell you. Whatever you've suffered over these last few weeks, whatever you've lost, whatever you've had to experience, I come to declare that I serve a God that recycles. I serve a God that causes all things to work together for the good of them, that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And I wonder if there's anybody that's watching me that's a witness to the fact that if you give God a little little becomes much when you put it in the hands of God